that now Matthew Buchan from Queen's Mary talking about non perturbative effects in, uh, sorry, flowing from 16 to 32 supercharged. Okay, um, so thank you very much uh, to the organizers for the invitation. So, um, what I'm going to tell you about is um, an infinite set of RG flows starting from some strongly coupled four dimensional n equals two theories um, that don't have any Lagrangians um, in any sense of the word and um, that end up at some uh, super conformal theories with um, 32 uh, Poincare plus special supercharges. So, this is based on some work. Uh, that appeared a few months ago uh, with my outstanding PhD student, Zoltan Latsko, and my great longtime collaborator, Takahiro Nishinaka. Oh, let's see, somehow this doesn't work. Okay. So, um, let me give you an outline of what I'm going to talk about. Um, so, uh, I'll give you some motivation for why I care about these RG flows that I'm going to tell you about besides the fact that I can study them. Um, and I'll review some pertinent um, uh, background material. So in particular, uh, these RG flows uh, involve supersymmetry enhancement, as you can see, because they start with 16 supercharges and go to 32. So I'll just review some basics of accidental symmetries and accidental supersymmetries in quantum field theory. And then I'll tell you a little bit about the UV starting points, what these n equals 2 sort of exotic n equals two super conformal field theories look like. Um, and instead of telling you in detail all the RG flows that we can study, I'll spend most of the time telling you about the simplest possible RG flow. Um, and then I'll generalize it and finally conclude with some open questions. So um, let me just give you a couple of broad goals of this uh, talk. So uh, the first goal uh, is to try to find a slightly more unorthodox way in which to construct theories with four-dimensional n equals to four supersymmetry. So usually we construct these theories more or less by taking some free fields and gauging um, some, some symmetry. Uh, and uh, that's, of course, a completely valid way to construct these theories, but it's also a bit boring and it would be fun to try to use quantum field theory to at least find some more interesting ways in which to construct these theories. Um, the second motivation is to try to find sort of a more controlled set of examples uh, which to study the phenomenon of supersymmetry enhancement, which has been playing a prominent role I guess, in our field in the last three years or so. So why do I care about these questions? Well, the, first, the reason I care about the first one, for me at least, is to try to answer the question of whether or not the space of n equals to four theories is complete. So in other words, are all four-dimensional n equals to four theories of super Yang mills type or not? So I think it's fair to say that a lot of the work in our field in the last 10 years, especially via the bootstrap, has been basically trying to carve out spaces of quantum field theories. And so if there's one space of quantum field theories that we ought to be able to understand, it should be this space of theories. Now, why care about the second goal? Well, because given UV data, by which I mean some superconformal field theory with its spectrum of operators and three-point functions, and given the, some relevant deformation, um, it's an interesting question to be able to predict um, what happens in the infrared, what kind of phase you get, whether you get supersymmetry enhancement or not. So I should point out, of course, I'll review a little bit that this, you know, many people have been studying this question. Um, these examples that I'll tell you today involve, of course, even more supersymmetry, which you might think gives you an advantage because you have more supersymmetry. But of course, also when you have more supersymmetry, the theories are a bit more rigid and you tend to sort of flow farther in the space of theories. And the RG flows are never short, so you're never going to get simple RG flows of the bank Zacks type. You'll get some more complicated RG flows. So, um, so as I said before, we often assume that the list of um, n equals to four theories is known. More or less what we do is we take algebra G, uh, we take an n equals one vector multiplet, three adjoint chiral multiplets, and we gauge. And you know, more or less up to some subtleties that I'll mention in a little bit, that's, that's what, we, what we do. Uh, and then the corresponding gauge coupling tau is exactly marginal in the sense that you can change tau and you don't introduce any renormalization. So you have a family of conformal field theories that are connected to each other along some conformal manifold. And this conformal manifold is more or less the fundamental domain of SL2Z. So when you go to weak coupling by going to the top, very top of this graph, you find a duality that takes you uh, to the very bottom. <coughs> 
So um, there are some subtleties to this. So even this simple construction is not fully understood because there are subtleties to do with the global structure of the gauge group and line operators and other extended operators. So it's not actually even completely settled yet what are the space of super Yang Mills theories. So there are various important and uh, high powered people in the field who are thinking about this question. Um, and I'm not really going to have anything more uh, to say about this. Um, instead, what I want to do is I want to think a little bit more about what might happen um, when you have um, theories that differ by some local operators from the usual n equals 4 theory. So in this talk, I'm not going to, of course, construct for you or convince you that we have a theory that's not n equals 4 super Yang Mills, but we'll find some interesting peculiarities that suggest that the theory might not be n equals 4 super Yang Mills. And so it's to think a bit more generally about what such a theory might look like if it exists. So if such a theory existed, then of course by definition it can't have a weak coupling limit. Um, also we know just from Dolan and Osborne and really work even from the 1980s that this theory has to have an exactly marginal deformation. In the case of a Lagrangian theory that's just the, you know, the Lagrangian or the gauge coupling, um, in a more abstract theory it would just be some other dimension 2 chiral ring operator that you can add to the prepotential. Now, something which is perhaps slightly less appreciated is that um, in any case, no matter what you have, Lagrangian or not, um, an n equals 4 theory with an odd dimensional vacuum moduli space necessarily has a global Witten anomaly for the SU2 contained inside of SU4R, where this SU2 is the global symmetry, is a global non-R symmetry from the point of view of the n equals to 2 subalgebra. So these are just general um, features that uh, that any non-Lagrangian uh, n equals 4 theory should have. Yeah. Oh, well, so, so if this theory is not an n equals 4 super Yang-Mills theory, this follows by definition, right? Because otherwise you would just be gauging some completely coupled matter. Um, this statement just follows from... Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, so what, what I'm asking is, so this, this first bullet point applies to theories with putative n equals 4 theories that would not be of super Yang-Mills type. If they existed, they could not have a weak coupling limit by definition. Okay, now regardless of whether the theory is Lagrangian or not, it follows just from superconformal representation theory and locality, namely the existence of a stress tensor, that there has to be an exactly marginal deformation. The reason is that the 4D n equals 4 superconformal algebra requires that the energy momentum tensor sit in a multiplet with an exactly marginal deformation, an operator of dimension 2 that you can add to the potential. So this just follows from locality and has nothing to do with the existence of super, with, with super Yang mills. This final question here is also just an anomaly matching thing. So again, it has nothing to do with the existence of a Lagrangian. If you have an odd dimensional vacuum moduli space, you have a Witten anomaly for this SU2 theory, and therefore by anomaly matching, you also have one in the UV theory, whether it's Lagrangian or not. So the philosophy of this talk is that I'm going to give you a strange way to construct n equals 4 theories. We're going to observe some peculiarities that might be explained by non-Lagrangian theory, um, things that differ from the standard n equals 4 theories, apparently. And so I just want to, you to keep these things in mind because as the talk goes along, um, these various points will come up again. Any other questions? Well, so if, if it differs by local operators, then it'll, it must have different multiplets. But one thing that I'll assume, of course, is that the theory is local, and that's going to be fine because the constructions that I'm going to use will start from some local n equals to 2 theory. I'll turn on a relevant deformation, and so whatever happens in the infrared, it'll be local. So there'll have to be, an there'll have to be a stress tensor multiplet, and therefore an exactly marginal deformation. But if the theory is exotic, then of course there must be some local multiplets, obviously not a stress tensor multiplet, which is universal, but other multiplets that should differ between this theory and the n equals 4 theory, the usual n equals 4 theories. Yeah. Ah, yeah, so, so n equals 4 superconformal algebra, right, which again has nothing to do with the existence of a Lagrangian, says that the only multiplet that can contain an energy momentum tensor also contains in it a prepotential, uh, a, an operator of dimension 2, a chiral operator of dimension 2. That's precisely the operator that when you add to the prepotential, it gives you exactly marginal 
deformations. And because the energy momentum tensor can't be renormalized, similarly, the marginal deformation can't be renormalized, and it must be exactly marginal. So um, one interesting question would be to ask how on earth could we build such theories in quantum field theory if they exist? Or maybe how could we disprove the existence of such theories? So one popular way, of course, would be to start with a conformal bootstrap to start directly in conformal field theory. And when you do that, you just write down a list of operators, um, a list of three-point functions, OPE coefficients, and you consider various correlators in the theory, and you impose the symmetries or the invariances that conformal field theory requires, like crossing symmetry and things like that. So this kind of technique has been very useful and very successful in the context of two-dimensional conformal field theory, especially the rational ones. And you could wonder if it extends also to 40, and if you could use that to try to construct such theories. Now, moreover, in four dimensions, theories with extended supersymmetry have a very nice connection with chiral algebras. So there's a sector of operators, which Chris Beam, Leonardo Rastelli, and company found, which is isomorphic to a two-dimensional chiral algebra. So this 4D, 2D connection suggests that perhaps you could use bootstrap in the chiral algebra sense to try to constrain these theories. And this has been done, or is being done, by these authors here, both in the presence of defects and without defects. Um, so this approach, of course, is very interesting and potentially very useful, but it's not clear that, you know, this is a particular sector of the theory. And it's not actually clear that even if it's well, it's not clear that such a sector of the theory necessarily determines the full 4D superconformal field theory. So maybe Sergei Gukov will talk about this on Friday. There are some there's some evidence that the chiral algebra that's related to the four-dimensional theory tells you a little bit more than you might expect, but it's not clear that it determines the theory. So these are of course interesting ideas and may ultimately answer the question. But another way to try to do it is to just find strange renormalization group flows starting from really weird starting points that end up on four-dimensional n equals four theories. So the, the positive side of such an approach is that no matter what you do, you're guaranteed to get something that makes sense. Because if you start with something local in the UV, you perturb it, you're going to get something that makes sense in the infrared. On the other hand, when you're just doing the bootstrap abstractly, you're not guaranteed to get anything that makes sense. And often you have to really compare to other results in the literature. Now, on the other hand, when you're studying this question via the RG flow, um, you of course have problems because when you use the RG flow, you don't always know what you're doing because there's strong coupling, and sometimes you think you're studying something, but you're actually studying something else. But in any case, this is the approach that we're going to take today, um, and I hope to convince you at least that there are some interesting puzzles that arise. So um, if we take this approach, this necessarily means that n equals 4 supersymmetry is emergent or accidental in the infrared. And the reason is that if we started with something which was, you know, again, n equals 4, a standard n equals 4 theory, deforming it in some way that preserves n equals 4 is guaranteed to give you another Lagrangian n equals 4 theory. So we need to start with something which has, if we want to get something uh, of this form in the IR, we need to start with something which has less than n equals 4 supersymmetry. So um, the basic idea behind accidental symmetries is the following. They're, they're, they happen a lot. I mean, they might be generic, really, in quantum field theory. And the idea is that you deform the UV theory. Say you have some UV SCFT. You could deform it by a relevant operator or even a VEV, whatever. And you flow to the infrared. And what you find is that correlation functions at large distances take the form of correlation functions of an infrared conformal field theory plus a bunch of corrections due to irrelevant operators. Now, if these irrelevant operators themselves are charged under symmetries of the IR CFT, then as these irrelevant couplings lambda tilde i decay to zero, then there will be some emergent symmetries that appear, start appearing in the correlation functions. So this idea has been studied a lot in the last 10, 15 years. So in particular, in three dimensions, you can start with n equals zero supersymmetry and enhanced n equals one or n equals two. This has been studied by condensed matter people and also high energy people. Um, and you also famously get ABJM, SUSY enhancement, when you start with 3D n equals 3, and you end up with n equals 6 and n equals 8. Also, Sergio recently talked about their nice work, where on one side of the duality, they have accidental supersymmetry enhancement from 3D n equals 1 to 3D n equals 2. And recently, in four dimensions, there's been a lot of work by various people also in this audience, including Sergio, Antonio, and various others on studying the, the question of supersymmetry enhancement in our G flows from 4D n equals 1 to 4D n equals 2. 
So these flows are interesting because oftentimes they give you some kind of Lagrangian description for theories that don't have n equals 2 Lagrangians. Although we'll see in the examples here today, this approach, at least naively, doesn't seem to be very useful. So there are also examples where you have flows from n equals 2 to n equals 4. There were a few examples that were discussed at the level of the Coulomb branch geometry by Philip Argyris and company. Are there any questions? Okay, so kind of the broadest thing, that we, the, the most general thing we could do is to either turn on a VEV or a relevant deformation of some UV theory and try to end up, or some combination, and try to end up on some weird N equals 4 theory in the infrared. So if it's a deformation via a VEV, then the UV, by which I mean the UV CFT plus the VEV that you turn on, could start from N equals 3, N equals 2, N equals 1, or N equals 0. I won't have anything useful to say about this approach where you turn on VEVs, but it could be very interesting in the future. Instead, I'm going to focus on starting from some UV SCFT and turning on a relevant deformation. And um, in this case, the UV theory could be N equals 2, 1, or 0. And of course, the N equals 0 case is very interesting, and probably in the years ahead we'll learn a lot more about it, but I don't really have anything useful to say about it. This, the case where you start from n equals 1 is again interesting, but it's pretty bewildering because there are a lot of different theories you can consider. So I'll focus mostly on n equals 2, and I'll try to convince you that even though this is kind of the most constrained possibility when we start from the UV and turn on a relevant deformation, it's still a very relatively wild and still not completely understood space of theories. So what are the UV starting points? So the UV starting points are going to be um, some twisted compactifications of the 4D n equals, uh, sorry, of the AN minus 1, 2 comma 0 theory on some CP1, where this CP1 has some coordinate, let's say, Z in some patch, and at Z equals infinity, there is a so-called irregular puncture that I'll describe soon. So these theories, they look extremely simple. I mean, this diagram looks very trivial, but really all the details are hidden in the still, I would say, not completely understood topology of this puncture. So there's been a lot of progress in this classification, mainly due to a lot of outstanding and pioneering work of Dan Shi, who really has illuminated, I would say, the space of these compactifications, and also work of Gaiotto moore Naitsky, work of Bonelli, Mariyoshi, and Tanzini, and then various other works that clean up and also add maybe a few examples. So this, this construction actually, although it looks much simpler perhaps than the construction that Gaiotto had, which you might be more familiar with, which involves a bunch of regular punctures, a reasonable conjecture that seems to be supported by all the empirical evidence is that this set of theories, maybe plus an additional regular puncture, actually includes all the theories that Gaiotto talks about, plus more, plus ones where, for example, you have chiral operators of 4dn equals 2 that, um, that are non-integer dimensional, so Argyris-Douglas type theories. So the idea is, again, to compactify the 2 comma 0 theory on such a surface and to end up with 4D n equals 2 superconformal field theory in the infrared that scales small compared to the compactification radius. So um, in order to do this, it's useful um, to actually first imagine that you have not just this Riemann surface, but also an S1 in the game, and to imagine that this S1, when you compactify the 2 comma 0 theory on S1, you get some 5D maximally, um, maximally symmetric Yang-Mills theory. And then in this theory, you have a twisted vector multiplet. So this is, this is called the Higgs field, which takes on this profile, or this field configuration, on the irregular punctured surface. And it has some very singular behavior at z equals infinity, at the point where this puncture is. So in particular, this first term here is a simple pole. And then these are higher order poles. In particular, this is an elf order pole. So um, these, this, this field has a bunch of entries that are matrices that are n by n, where n is the n of the an minus 1 theory, um, and they're traceless and diagonal. So these transform in the adjoint of the gauge group of the super Yang Mills. Now, um, these are part, this, this field forms part of a solution to Hitchens equations. And when you compactify the theory then on this CP1, this punctured CP1, it gives rise to the Higgs branch, well, to a 3D theory whose Higgs branch, um, which, which is mirror actually to the direct compactification of the 4D theory, to the direct S1 compactification of the 4D theory. So in particular, the Higgs branch of that 3D mirror gives you the Coulomb branch of the direct reduction, and also gives you information about the 4D theory too. So in particular, the Cyberg-Witten curve of the 4D theory is just given by the spectral curve of the Hitchens. 
and we'll use this, this fact later. So what it turns out is that these theories um, can be specified by a series of Young diagrams. So in particular, what we do is we study the singular behavior. Of course, this second ellipsis contains in general an infinite number of um, regular terms. But these divergent terms, these, these terms that blow up at the z equals infinity boundary, um, in general can be characterized, they're diagonal matrices, and they can be characterized by the degeneracy of their eigenvalues. And the degeneracy of the eigenvalues are encoded in these Young diagrams. So in particular, ni1 is some positive integer that tells you the degeneracy of one block of eigenvalues, ni2 tells you the degeneracy of the next block, etc., up to niki, where there's one Young diagram for each singular matrix. And these, these Young diagrams are such that these columns sum up, the heights of these columns sum up to the n of the an minus 1 theory. Now, in the case where you have some columns that have height greater than 1, of course, you have a degeneracy in this field. You have some eigenvalues that are the same. And this is, these lead to the so-called type 3 theories of Dan Shi, and these are theories that are still not completely understood, but I think it's reasonable to say probably contain a, a lot of very, very interesting physics. So, in particular, it's not yet completely clear which set of Young diagrams give you a consistent theory. There are some constraints arriving, arising from Levy subalgebras and other such things but it's not completely clear. But the main claim of this talk will be that if you take the infinite set of 40 n equals 2 type 3 theories that are specified by these three Young diagrams, where y1 and y0 are both equal to this block of k little n's, where n is greater than or equal to 2, and k1 or k0, they're equal and greater than or equal to 3, and this Young diagram y minus 1 with entries n, and then where I've broken this last height into two columns of height n minus 1 and 1, that the theory specified by these Young diagrams uh, will, involve, will give rise naturally to supersymmetry enhancement and some interesting physics in the infrared. So again, these, these, I should mention that this y minus 1, it, it's related to the simple pole, and that has an interesting interpretation. Basically, these are the so-called mass parameters of the theory. So they are related by supersymmetry to the Noether currents for the internal symmetries, although it's not quite true. Actually, what this gives is it gives a lower bound on the flavor symmetry because there can be accidental enhancements. But roughly speaking, it gives you a measure of the amount of global symmetry in the UV theory. So these are the theories that we're going to discuss. Are there any questions? Okay, so this is a somewhat abstract discussion, but as we'll see in a minute, we'll get much more down to earth by using dualities. And um, so what I'm going to study for most of this talk is the simplest RG flow, the flow that you get basically by starting from the theory with a third order pole with Young diagram 222, two, two, then a second order, order pole again with Young diagram 222, two, two, and then a first order pole specified by, by the Young diagram 2211. So this description might seem somewhat alien to people who haven't thought about this before and wild ramification and all these kinds of things. So another way to obtain this theory is to actually start from a duality involving much better known superconformal field theories. So um, in the mid-90s, um, Argyris and Douglas found um, some superconformal field theories that arise on the Coulomb branch of 40n equals 2 gauge theories. And these are fixed points where there are mutually non-local degrees of freedom that become massless at the same time. And one of the theories that they found, actually one of the theories that they found in a follow-up paper with Witten and Seiberg and Ronan Plesser, was this theory, which I call, actually Chekhody and Vafa call, the A1D4 theory. So this is just the theory that arises when you consider SU2 n equals 2 super QCD with three flavors, and you take the most singular point, essentially, on the Coulomb branch. So this is some 40 n equals 2 isolated super conformal field theory with an SU3 global flavor symmetry. So this is very well studied. It's been around for 23 years, but you can still get some interesting physics from it. So for example, since it has an SU3 global symmetry, one tempting thing to do is to gauge that symmetry and see if you can build more conformal field theories using these guys as building blocks. And indeed, sort of the minimal thing you can do is you can take two copies of this theory and you can gauge a diagonal SU3 and include three additional flavors. And if you do that, you can check that the beta function is vanishing. So in particular, this looks a lot like SU3 with six flavors, which you also know is conformal. But here, what you've done instead is you've replaced half the flavors by Argyris-Douglas theories. 
excellent question. So, um, so the a, this A1D4 theory does have an n equals one Lagrangian, absolutely, which actually I believe Jay Wan Song and Mariyoshi found. Um, however, there is no such Lagrangian that has manifest in the UV the SU3 flavor symmetry. So if you try to construct this conformal manifold in the UV, it seems very difficult unless you're considering very protected quantities. So, but soon we're going to get out of this, actually a theory for which there again is no known Lagrangian and is isolated. And the way we do that is we do basically what our Juris and Cyberg did in the SU3 NF equals six case, and we take the coupling tau SU3 to infinity. So if we do that, or we take it to strong coupling, uh, then we get a dual description involving an SU2 gauge group coupled to some semi-mysterious theory called T3 three halves with, again, another A1D4 theory sitting here. So if you're familiar with the usual Argyra Cyberg story, basically these, this A1D4 theory plays the role roughly of the hypermultiplet in the SU2 side of the duality. And this T3 three halves theory plays the role of the minahan nemeshansky theory. And actually, the fact that these A1D4s are sort of, in some sense, if you blur your eyes, interchangeable with um, free fields is actually the jumping off point of an interesting story that I'm not going to tell you more about that actually relates the physics of these theories to the two-dimensional Ising model. So, but what I want to focus on today instead is this factor here, this T3 three halves. So it's called T3 three halves because basically it has a chiral ring, an n equals two chiral ring. So in other words, Coulomb branch generators. Whenever I talk about chiral ring, I never mean Higgs branch generators. I always mean generators of the Coulomb branch. Um, and this has n equals two chiral ring generators of dimension three and three halves. So by definition, it simply cannot have a four dimensional n equals to two Lagrangian because any such Lagrangian necessarily has integer dimensional chiral operators. Moreover, there is no known Lagrangian even in the n equals one sense for this theory. So this, this theory is a bit subtle, um, but uh, it, we, in a paper, we use the chiral algebra bootstrap. So we use the fact that there is a set of operators which are related to a two-dimensional chiral algebra to argue that this T3 three halves theory actually factorizes into a free piece plus some irreducible piece called Tx. Now the symmetries, you can read off the symmetries. The symmetries of this Tx theory are just, uh, well, this T3 three halves theory are just SU2 from the free hyper, which has an SU2 symmetry, and SU2 times SU3 from this, from this factor. So if that's not obvious, then what you can do is go back to this side of the duality where you see these have SU3 flavor symmetry. You've gauged a diagonal copy of it, so you don't have any flavor symmetry left over here, but you have a U3 flavor symmetry coming from the hypermultiplets. Now on this side of the duality, this has again SU3. You've gauged an SU2, so you have a U1 left over, and then this guy must supply an SU3. And of course, when you decouple this theory and consider it as an isolated block, it must at least have an SU2. And what our chiral algebra analysis told us is that it actually has an SU2 times SU2. And the SU2 that you're gauging in this case is just the diagonal one. But this fact that it splits up in this way is very interesting. And actually, it gives us the first hint that there is some n equals to 4 physics hiding behind this theory. And the reason is that the SU2 flavor symmetry in this TX theory actually has to have a global Witten anomaly. And the reason it has to have a global Witten anomaly is not too hard to see. So it's easy to use some RG arguments to argue that the A1D4 theory itself cannot have a Witten anomaly. And that just follows from the fact that it's defined by starting from SU2 gauge theory with three flavors. And any SU2 subgroup of that SU3 does not have a Witten anomaly. So that must be true when you flow to the Coulomb branch to the superconformal point. But since this whole theory makes sense, that means that this guy must also not have a Witten anomaly, otherwise this gauge theory wouldn't make sense. So since this guy doesn't have a Witten anomaly, we know that a hypermultiplet on its own does have a Witten anomaly, so that means this must also have a compensating Witten anomaly. And so the fact that this SU2 has a Witten anomaly is our first hint that there is some potentially n equals to four physics hiding that we have to expose. So, but that's, that, that's great, but actually there's, there are much more interesting connections you can find to n equals to four. And the starting off point for us was just looking at the superconformal index of this TX theory. So we more or less managed, well, Zoltan actually managed to basically compute this index. And basically what it involves is it involves a sum over um, affine katz uh characters of SU2 and SU3 of the flavor symmetry 
of the 4dn equals 2 theory um, with highest weights specified by some Dinkin labels, lambda and lambda comma lambda. And the index just takes the form. The index is uh, a sort of a sum, if you like, over some protected operators in the theory. I won't tell you much more about what it is other than that. But it takes the form of a sum over an infinite set of, um, of, of uh, affine Katz Moody characters at the critical level. So if you're an expert on affine algebras, you know that the critical level necessarily involves um, representations for which you don't really have an energy momentum tensor. So there, of course, this is a local theory. So there's a correction term that adds back in an energy momentum tensor and various other things, and also some term which tells you a little bit about the moduli space of the theory. Now, even if this looks completely alien to you, I hope you can see that it involves an infinite amount of information for the theory, and it turns out to be very closely related to a much simpler theory, to the index of a much simpler theory, the so-called T2 theory. This is just a, a collection of eight free half hypermultiplets. And again, if you write this theory, um, the index for this theory, you can write it as a sum over um, affine characters, this time of SU2 times SU2 times SU2, again at the critical level, and again with a correction that's identical to the one in the TX case. And the prefactors here look quite similar too. There's just a small difference related to a small difference in the moduli space. Any questions? So the fact that these two indices are so similar, they're again sums over diagonal representations of some flavor symmetry. In this case, SU2 times SU3. In this case, SU2 times SU2 times SU2. With identical, if you like, correction terms, suggests that these two theories ought to be related in some way. Now, we know that the T2 theory itself is very intimately related with n equals to 4, because if you think about it in the Gaiotto language, you think of it as a sphere in the A1, 2 comma 0 theory, with three punctures, and you can glue any of those two punctures together, and if you do that, you end up with a one puncture torus, which is just the n equals 4 super Yang Mills SU2 theory plus a decoupled hyper that's annoying, but more or less, it's the n equals 4 theory. So you might then guess or conjecture that you should do something similar involving the vector multiplet of SU3 to get to some n equals to 4 theory in the TX case. And that sentiment turns out to be more or less correct, but the right thing to do instead of introducing a dynamical vector multiplet as you do in this case is to instead introduce a background vector multiplet and turn on VEVs for it. So in other words, turn on mass parameters for SU3. So how do you see that? It's not obvious, of course. Um, but the way to see that is to consider a particular limit of this index here. So this is a fugacity. Um, Q is a fugacity. So it goes, let's say, as e to the minus beta for some beta. And this beta, more or less, represents the um, radius of the S1 in the S1 times S3 partition function when you think of this index as some kind of twisted S1 times S3 partition function. And in particular, it's nice to take the beta goes to zero limit. That corresponds to shrinking the S1 and then studying what happens to the theory on S3. And when you do that, when you take that limit, and again, it requires some care, but what you sh can show is that you get the partition function for this 3D n equals to 4 theory. So 3D n equals 4, of course, is the dimensional reduction of 4D n equals 2. It's not the dimensional reduction of 4D n equals 4. Um, and this diagram here is a diagram in 3D n equals 4 language. So in particular, this is a U2 gauge group of 3D n equals 4. These are three fundamental flavors. And this is an adjoint hypermultiplet of U2 that transforms into 3 plus 1 of the SU2. So in particular, you see all the flavor symmetries. So the lore is more or less that the Higgs branch and the flavor symmetries roughly should remain the same in going from 4D to 3D, and you see that's the case. These three flavors give you an SU3 factor. These, this triplet here gives you actually another SU2 flavor symmetry. And then the, the singlet, the adjoint of U2, which is of course a singlet, it's decoupled from the theory, gives you another SU2. So this reproduces precisely the flavor symmetry of the theory we started from. Any, any questions so far? Okay. So um, it doesn't take a lot of work to see that you can get from that diagram to something that looks a lot more like 3dn equals 8. So in particular, if you turn on SU3 masses for the triplet of fundamental flavors, you're either going to get rid of, in general, for generic values of the masses, you're going to get rid of all three masses, thus getting this diagram here. For non-generic values, you might get rid of two of these masses, but the magic 
of 3D supersymmetric quantum field theory actually gives another quantum mechanical mass to the third guy in any case. And you always end up with this theory here, which is a 3D n equals 8 theory, and it is the it, 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 has this, it, it is the 3D n equals 8 superconformal field theory that you get from the U2 3D n equals 8 gauge theory, turning on the gauge coupling and flowing to the infrared. So in particular, this is, of course, the dimensional reduction of 4D n equals to 4 U2 super Yang mills. So we immediately see here that there is another connection between this TX theory and n equals 4 in 4 dimensions and n equals 8 in 3 dimensions. So in particular, if you're a fan of category theory or whatever and you like commuting diagrams, we have a commuting diagram. So um, if you imagine here setting n equals to 2, this little n equals to 2 in this diagram, and setting k equals to 3, then we have this commuting diagram where here in the UV, we started from the T3 3 halves theory, we compactified it on a circle preserving eight Poincare supercharges, and we end up with some U2 gauge theory with an adjoint and three fundamental flavors. And then we turn on masses for these flavors, and we end up with this U2 gauge theory with uh, this U2 n equals 8 theory that flows to a superconformal field theory. Similarly, in four dimensions, we have the same symmetries, and so we can add to the superpotential moment maps for the SU3, and we flow from this T3 3 halves theory to some interesting, potentially, theory in four dimensions in the infrared. Now, the fact that this diagram commutes strongly rests on the fact all the moves that I've performed preserve eight Poincaré supercharges. So in particular, turning on these mass parameters can't turn on Chern-Simons terms in 3D. If we turned on Chern-Simons terms, this diagram would not commute. Also, um, it rests on the fact that flavor symmetries in 4dn equals 2 are non-anomalous. This has nothing to do with a Lagrangian. It just follows from the OPE of 4dn equals 2. So this diagram commutes. So we never get things like monopole operators, say, that appear in the cases with less supersymmetry. And so um, this suggests that we have some sort of interesting and constrained um, set of RG flows. And then the name of the game is to try to understand a bit more about what, about what, uh, about what this, this theory here is. Okay. So the question, the, the really interesting question, of course, is what happens in the R goes to infinity limit? So the limit where the radius of this S1 goes to infinity. So one question is, is the infrared theory in that limit a 4D n equals to 4 theory? And if so, is it the same thing as U2 n equals to 4 super Yang mills or not? So the deformation that we turned on makes it clear that we have an IR theory with a Witten anomaly, at least in the interacting piece in the IR. Because remember, we started from the T3 3 halves theory which had some decoupled hypermultiple, which is just along for the ride, and an interacting piece. And in that interacting piece, we turn on some SU3 moment maps. Those don't break SU2. So the fact that the TX theory had a Witten anomaly carries over directly to the IR theory. So that's a good sign. It means that, again, we could have an n equals to 4 theory in four dimensions. Um, but at this point, we might be tempted to also use the fact that we have a three-dimensional Lagrangian to try to con con conclude something about the four-dimensional theory. But I emphasize the RG flow in 4D to 3D never starts in three dimensions and ends up in four dimensions. It always starts in four dimensions and ends up in three dimensions because you lose information by compactifying. So in higher dimensions where you have more supersymmetry, I don't know, where, where you have more constrained, let's say, theories, such as between five and six dimensions, that the, the reverse reasoning might hold. But here, between four dimensions and three dimensions, it manifestly does not. So in particular, if you start in three dimensions with this Lagrangian, there are at least two four-dimensional theories that it could flow to, that, that, that could flow to it. So one, of course, is the four-dimensional theory with this exact same Lagrangian. The other one is the T3 3 halves theory, which manifestly does not have a four-dimensional n equals to two Lagrangian because it has fractional dimensional Coulomb branch operators. And these same ideas carry over in an infinite number of examples. So the fact that we have a Lagrangian in three dimensions has no bearing. I mean, we have a Lagrangian here. This theory is manifestly non-Lagrangian. Here we have a Lagrangian, so we cannot use that to conclude that this n equals to four theory in four dimensions is super young mills. So one thing we can try to do is to gain a bit more understanding by writing down the cyber witten curve of this theory. That's not the most ideal thing to do, because writing down the cyber witten curve 
tells you something about an effective description of the theory, it about the theory away from the superconformal point, tells you about the theory on the Coulomb branch, but it's the easiest thing we can do. And as we'll see, it turns out to give some, some information which looks interesting. So if you take what I told you before about the Higgs field, this phi that I introduced before, and you just manually plug in what the Young diagrams tell you, the degeneracies that they tell you, then you get some third order pole at z equals infinity with some parameters here. And you get a first order, a second order pole, sorry, at z equals infinity with some parameters here with the degeneracies corresponding to the Young diagram 2, 2, 2. And similarly, you get a first order pole with these mass parameters here. Now, um, again, using the fact that the one form has the form x dz, you can convince yourself that z will have dimension a half. So these guys will be dimensionless quantities. And they're actually spurious. I, I'm, I'm sorry to leave them in here, but really they can be removed by, by, by transformations, coordinate transformations that preserve the one form. Similarly, all these b's can be reduced to a single b of dimension a half, which is just the dimension a half coupling that corresponds to the dimension three halves operator in the UV theory. Finally, we have these mass parameters here that correspond to the SU2 and SU3 mass parameters. So when you set M3 to zero, you get the SU3 mass parameters, the two SU3 mass parameters, and then when you, and basically when you consider non-zero M3, you get the SU2 mass parameter, the diagonal one. And then you have a bunch of non-singular terms which give you the VEVs of the Coulomb branch operator. So in particular, these C1s have dimension three halves, and they are the VEVs of the operator's dual to the Bs. So in particular, there's a, actually a single B that's physical, and in the end, there, there's actually also a single C that's, that's physical. And these have dimension three halves, again, by just Sporion analysis. And you can compute the cyborg witten curve basically by plugging this expansion into this determinant. And what you find is this mess, so I, please don't focus on all the terms because it's not pretty, but I just want to write it here just to illustrate what you do. So um, you have a variety of different terms here, um, and these are all, in the cyborg witten curve, these are all either couplings relevant or marginal couplings of the UV theory, and so vacuum expectation values for chiral operators that, are, that can deform the Coulomb branch, that can take you to different points on the Coulomb branch. And, um, well, and also mass parameters, the Ms. So in particular, you have this complicated looking cyborg witten curve with coordinates X and Z and various parameters. U2 is a Coulomb branch parameter of dimension three. It's this dimension three operator that I was telling you about before. U1 is a Coulomb branch operator of dimension three halves, and these different m's are the mass parameters of the UV theory. So given this curve, um, one thing that you can um, try to do is you can try to use it. So this is, if you like, the moduli space corresponding to the UV theory in the commuting diagram that I wrote here. So this is the Coulomb branch of this theory here. And one thing that you can do that's standard that people actually used to find the Argyros-Douglas theories in the 90s and still use to this day, is to try to cur curve out the Coulomb branch of the theory that you get by following an RG flow. So in particular, the IR Coulomb branch is some subset, or I don't know, some variety or something of the UV Coulomb branch. And so you can, given the UV Coulomb branch specified by the cyborg witten curve, you can try to implement this flow at that level and study then the Coulomb branch of this T4D IR theory, which is the theory that we want to study. So how does one do that? One takes this ugly expression and you turn on some RG parameter, some cutoff, say. Call it M, you give it a name, and you take a scaling limit where M goes to infinity. And you have to assign all the parameters that appear in the Coulomb branch description of the UV theory some particular scaling with M, some power or some functional dependence on M. And when you take that limit M goes to infinity, you just take the terms that are left over this defines for you some homogeneous polynomial, which again describes the, uh, the infrared, the, the Coulomb branch of the infrared theory that you get from, from the RG flow. So we implemented this kind of indirect way of studying the RG flow, and we looked at all possible scaling limits we could find. And of course, without doing things at the level of Bourbaki and proving that those are the only allowed scaling limits, the only ones that we were able to find after smacking our heads and doing a bunch of different consistency checks were up to isomorphisms, this scaling limit here. Okay, so the details of the scaling limit don't matter, but all I want to tell you 
is that this capital X and capital Z correspond to coordinates on the curve that describes the Coulomb branch of the infrared theory after the RG flow. And this operator U2, you'll remember, started its life in the Coulomb branch of the UV theory having dimension 3. This parameter M is a mass parameter of dimension 1. So therefore, by Sporion analysis, this U has scaling dimension 2, which is exactly what you expect for the VEV of an operator that's dual to something exactly marginal, right? Because an exactly marginal deformation in any 4D theory with at least n equals to 2 supersymmetry is a chiral operator of scaling dimension 2, which is precisely what pops out here. Now, if you plug this or the isomorphic limits into the curve, what you find is the following curve. Um, so you have this dimension 2 operator u, and what you find is you find that the curve is tuned necessarily to a cusp. So in particular, you find this coordinate, scaling coordinate x, scaling coordinate z. And if this were a non-singular curve, then these four roots, the four roots of this quartic polynomial would be different. But what you necessarily find is you find that these two, you have two degenerate roots of degeneracy 2. So in particular, this is what you find for an n equals 4 curve, at least at the infrared effective level. This is what you find when you study a usual n equals 4 theory tuned to a cusp. But it's very peculiar, right? Because usually when you study n equals to 4 theories, you see the marginal deformation in the curve. The UV marginal deformation that you have descends to a marginal deformation of the infrared theory, of the, of the infrared theory on the Coulomb branch. So what I'm saying here is that, well, you have naturally in the Hitchin system description, in the description of the T3 three halves or TX theory, you naturally have a dimensionless object, this guy that is of the form BM to the minus one half. But you see that this object that, that at the superconformal point should correspond to something marginal, you see that in the effective cyborg witten description, it's actually been mapped to something irrelevant, something that doesn't change the periods of the curve, which is somewhat peculiar because usually in a Lagrangian theory, when the, you know, the gauge coupling, when you change it, it gives different masses to the W boson. That's just the statement of the Higgs mechanism, right? You have some semi-classical Higgs mechanism where the gauge get a mass that depends on the coupling. But here, we observe that that's not the case. Instead, even though you have a dimensionless coupling and you have a dimension 2 operator U, so there is certainly a marginal, exactly marginal coupling in the superconformal point, um, when you go to the Coulomb branch, that exactly marginal coupling has become irrelevant, which is puzzling. So the question is, what on earth does this mean? So the first thing to note is that, of course, as I said, I sh we have not been able to disprove that there is not a more general scaling limit at play. However, I personally do not believe this is the case. We've checked, we've done many non-trivial checks, and these seem to be the only trivial, the only non-trivial scaling limits. And so it seems that we're capturing the, the correct Coulomb branch from the point of view of the starting point. Another possibility is that the this infrared exactly marginal deformation, so in other words, the deformation that's dual to this dimension two operator, the U, or the, whose VEV is U, in other words, the marginal operator sitting in this theory here, the the it, one logical possibility is that even though that marginal coupling might be invisible in the flow from the original TX theory to TIR, it is a logical possibility that there could be another UV fixed point that has you know, some kind of cyborg-like duality with the original starting point that does see the marginal coupling. So that's possible. We haven't been able to disprove this. We're working on obviously trying to do that. But um, besides these two possibilities, the most exciting possibility perhaps is that the theory in the infrared is something we've never seen before, which is an exotic n equals 4 theory. So this TIR4D has some conformal manifold, which is parameterized by the coupling dual to the operator whose VEV is U in the previous slide. So this is this conformal manifold M. And what we're saying when we say that the cyborg witten curve is stuck at a cusp and the apparently exactly marginal deformation of the UV theory gets mapped to something irrelevant in the IR, what we're saying effectively, physically, is that no matter which point you start on in this conformal manifold, you end up at the same infrared point. Now, this might disturb you, and I, know, I actually don't know of any argument against this picture, and it also explains things very nicely, because 
Um, if the theory is non-Lagrangian, there's no semi-classical Higgs mechanism, and there's no reason why those gauge bosons should be anything but effective gauge bosons in the IR. And then there's no reason, in principle, why the marginal coupling on this conformal manifold should even appear in the infrared physics. So this is a possibility, and we are obviously looking to try to analyze these conformal manifolds from a bunch of other technical uh, viewpoints. Are there, are there any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so uh, th the reason I say that is that what we can grant, I think, is that if you deform this theory, it has a cyborg witten description. The reason I can grant that is that the starting point was something that I got from the 2 comma 0 theory, which had a Hitchin, Hitchin, Hitchin system description, which had a determinant, of, you know, a cyborg witten curve manifestly associated with it. So I think anything you get in the infrared has to have a cyborg witten curve. And now I'm looking at the cyborg witten curve we found, and the marginal coupling that, prevent, that presents itself in the Hitchin system, Q, leaves this polynomial degenerate. So it's not the usual marginal coupling that moves roots apart. Instead, it keeps these roots clustered together. So that suggests, this is the, if you want, the cyborg witten interpretation, perhaps, of this behavior here. These are flows. So, so imagine each of these ultraviolet X's, or, well, they, I, you can see them, so they're not ultraviolet, but these, yeah. Good, good, yeah, yeah. So, so there are many ultraviolets and UVs in this story, so it's probably very confusing. So infrared, what I mean, so remember, I started from what I call TUV. TUV was a 4D N equals 2 theory. I turned on a mass parameter, I ended up in TIR. TIR is now itself a super conformal field theory, and TIR, we're claiming, has a conformal manifold of this type. So these are now flows from TIR to a further infrared point, where these flows really going onto the Coulomb branch. And this corresponds, this red X is kind of the unfortunate cyborg witten description. The cyborg witten description in this case doesn't seem to be interesting. It's a point, more or less. Whereas this, so it does not capture much of the physics. Exactly, yeah, and the red X is the final infrared. Um, yeah, it's okay because, I mean, so in general, you have sometimes you have couplings with positive powers, sometimes you have couplings with negative powers. What matters is that at the end, the leading order behavior of the curve in M is something non-trivial, right? So, of course, if you assign some random values of M, scalings with M, you'll end up with garbage. What we're saying, more or less, is that given the UV Hitchin system, the only sensible assignment of M is the ones that we've given up to some isomorphisms up to, that have to do with action of vial groups, and that those things necessarily give you this picture here. But it's not a problem to have things blowing up and some things blowing up, some things not blowing up. That's okay as long as the final thing has some leading order behavior that makes sense. That's a common thing that happens in these. I mean, we're not the first people to have, I mean, often the leading term is divergent, and then, you know, what does that mean? That means that you can just forget about the other terms you just set those to zero, you get the form, you get an equation of the form m times something, m to some positive power times something equals zero. So then you conclude that that something equals zero. That's standard. Um, I mean, I, am I happy with this kind of approach to the RG flow? Of course not. It's like something that's slightly stuck in the 90s, right? But um, it's a hard problem, and I mean, it seems at least that even within that framework, which has been successful in the last 20 years, we get to a puzzle. What's that? Ah, so the dimension of this Coulomb branch is just, it's, it's one, it's rank one. Yeah, I mean, so you have, of course, there's a decoupled, yeah? So, so you, started with some, you started with something with rank two, right? Th so you had something which is dimension three, three halves. The dimension three halves guy becomes just a decoupled U1. So you have some Coulomb branch which is uninteresting, which gets factored off, and then you have one remaining Coulomb branch of complex dimension one. Well, n equals four, SU2 n equals 4 theory also has a Coulomb branch of rank 1. I mean, it depends what you mean by Coulomb. SU4 
that rotates what you might call the Higgs branch and the Coulomb branch. But I mean, here we're talking about the thing that you've chosen to be the thing charged under the yuan. So, so I can also um, give you, it's very easy to generalize these, this picture considerably. So instead of having n equals 2, you can have n be anything larger than or equal to 2. Um, y minus 1 now takes this form here. And then if you, you can check what this means for the theory. In particular, you find scaling dimensions of operators that have the form 3 halves 3. That's what we had before. But now they continue all the way up to 3n over 2, which looks quite a bit like the n equals 4 super Yang mills chiral ring generators, but now with spacings in units of 3 halves instead of 1. This is, again, the UV theory. And now you can again consider the S1 reduction, and you get some very similar story here, where you have UN now instead of U2. And you can even be a little more general if you so desire. And you can take now little k ends, where little k is greater than or equal to 3. And you have this set of mass parameters. And um, you just require that little n times little k is just the big N of the an minus 1 theory. And again, you can perform the dimensional reduction. And you just find something which has the form of a un theory, un n equals 2 gauge multiple with an adjoint hyper and k fundamental flavors. And again, you find these nice commuting diagrams where now you turn on mass parameters for SUK instead of SU3, and you do S1 compactifications that preserve eight Poincare supercharges. And now in three dimensions, you can do the same thing, but turn on SUK mass parameters and get rid of these hypermultiplet flavors. And similarly, no matter what you do, even if you end up with naively, classically, one fundamental flavor here, quantum mechanically, it'll always flow to this UN. So we have sort of a nice set of infinite, an infinite set of examples where there's pretty clearly supersymmetry enhancement, and there are some interesting puzzles. So this is at least some new kind of playground, which I think at least is a new twist on a lot of the work that's been done in the last three years. It's a little different in flavor than, than the rest of the work that's been done in, in in supersymmetry enhancement. Um, but we can see we've gotten some arguments, at least I've given you here, in this n equals 2k equals 3 case, that we seem to have a 40 n equals 4 superconformal field theory. And we never really had to discuss free fields at all, or at least free four-dimensional fields. So it's still a question, though, to try to understand what is the right interpretation of this four-dimensional theory. And this is something we're working on. And so, of course, this begs the question of whether we know everything there is to know about 4D n equals 4. And you can also wonder why stop there. You can also wonder about things like the ADE classification of 2 comma 0 and other such things. So that's all I have to say. Thanks. One more questions? The, the flow from n equals 16 supercharges to yeah. n equals 32. But what you, 